time. Hooray! Yay! Yay! There we go. So if anybody asks, Scott, Doc, mm -hmm. why do you guys come on the air always chuckling every time you have a show? It's all the <laughs> yeah. bad jokes we tell each other. It's after, yeah, hearing about the episodes of Daniel Barth's, um, you know, adventures in life. <laughs> so. Uh, I have decided on yeah, I a, have my own adventures, man. I do. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Everybody sure does. Do. But uh, at some point I'm going to write, I'm going to write my memoirs as an educator. <laughs> and I've, I've decided on a title. It's going to be allergic to water. Allergic to water. Okay. Because I had, I had someone tell me that a parent told me that. Oh yeah. That I was allergic to water. Yeah. That the child yeah, was about allergic a million to water. and one thing students will tell you. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Yeah you know, to get out of learning anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I assigned uh, an activity. But that is a learning process in itself. It is. It the, is. The energy and creativity that you have to have to get out of learning, you know, the curriculum that is put forth. <laughs> the stuff people yep. do to avoid the work oh, yeah. is or often more strenuous to, than the work itself. To, to cheat on tests or whatever it is. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I had, this is many years ago, so I can tell this story. I had a student and it was a physics final. And, and, and back in the day, no notes, right? You had to just know this stuff. And so the kid asked in advance, can I have gum in the exam? Because it helps me. I'm like, okay, as long as you don't put it on the bottom of your chair or something dumb, okay. So he comes in with two of the big jumbo packs of Wrigley Spearmint gum. Jeez. And he's every couple of minutes, he's putting a, a piece in his mouth. Uh, uh, and after a while, it's just cud. Uh, uh, uh. And he's, he's having trouble holding this all in his mouth. And, he, and a line of black drool comes down his chin. Ew. And I walked over to him with a trash can and I said, spit it out. What? I'm like, no. And it, his mouth is full of ink. And I'm looking at this in various sticks of gum have been pulled out and like can i have a piece of gum no wait wait and i pull it out and yes in ballpoint ink in very tiny writing every stick of gum has been ironed smooth you know how it has that little texture no it's been ironed and written on with notes in formulae and <laughs> tiny tiny ballpoint writing wow and they said you know, I'm betting you by the time you put all this work in into your cheat prep, I'm betting yeah. you know most of this without notes anyway. Oh, yeah. He said, yeah, I know. And I said, and you get the zero anyway. Yeah, I know. Can I go to the bathroom and wash my mouth out? This tastes terrible. Maybe you could get it, give him a second grade on cheating, you know, and you get a cheat kind score of. 100. Yeah. Kind of. Uh -huh. Doesn't add to the real score, but. You know. No. Then I had the student who would steal other people's homework papers from the in basket oh. and erase their name or wow. blot it out with Sharpie marker and then write their own name in uh -huh. and turn them in. And students were coming up to me and saying, well, I'm sure I turned this in, but I kept all the homework. I didn't give it back. I said, if you want it back, make a copy. And so I would always say, if someone said, oh, I'm sure I turned that in. I would say, okay, check the box because if you did, it's there. And if I missed it, I'll fix it. And I had a kid come up to me and say, well, um, I found several of the assignments I'm missing, but now there's somebody else's name on them. Hmm. And so of course we could go and pull all that person's work for the semester out. And we found out that about 70% of it was other people's doings. Yeah. And she wouldn't, snitch from the same person every week that would be obvious uh <laughs> well, that would be unethical right yeah exactly um and uh you know i went oh gee and uh then i was mean because i was i was keeping a child out of their rightful place in university mm -hmm. i said well if i was really mean i'd pass your kid anyway and send him off to an expensive school with yeah. a great recommendation. I mean, to the I was really mean. Yeah, they need to go to Harvard. 
Yeah. They are brilliant. Yes. Uh, Don't anybody tell you different. Yeah. But there are brilliant kids. I think. <clears throat> there are brilliant kids, and I've had some. Amazing kids. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I've had brilliant kids, and uh, I remember I caught one kid cheating one year. Did you? Yeah, on a chemistry exam, and uh, met with his dad, and his dad said, well, Jack has choices in life. Jack can go to Harvard and be a doctor, or he can go to Yale and be a lawyer, or he can go to Columbia and be an engineer. His mother and I have decided Jack has choices. I'm like, oh, geez, it's not a mystery. The kid is cheating. The mystery isn't he hasn't murdered you in your beds <laughs> for driving him like a, like a cow across, in you know, a cattle drive across Texas to Oklahoma. Ah, hooray, teaching. An international research team led out of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center have obtained the first direct detection of water vapor on Jupiter's moon, Europa. This hey, Europa. Signal captured by an instrument on the Keck telescope in Hawaii. Past NASA missions and Earth-bound telescopes have found strong evidence suggesting there is an ocean of water beneath Europa's icy surface and plumes seemingly bursting through cracks in space. In this recent study, the scientists observed the entire surface of Europa over 17 days in 2016 and 2017. In one instance, there was a short-lived spike in infrared light, a spectral fingerprint that could only be due to water vapor. When water escapes from Europa's subsurface reservoirs, the resulting vapor is exposed to radiation from the sun, and the H2O molecules give off a distinctive infrared glow. This glowing signal, detected by Keck, allowed scientists the first direct measurement of water vapor on Europa. And here, scientists measured over 2,000 tons of water in the plume, nearly the volume of an Olympic swimming pool. While scientists currently have limited ability to detect liquid water on Europa, this new detection of water in vapor form is the next best thing in the search for one of the most essential ingredients for life. This discovery will inform future observations of Europa, including NASA's upcoming Europa Clipper mission, which will study the Jovian moon at close range. These efforts should further unlock the secrets of Europa and its potential for life beyond Earth. And there you go. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Scott Roberts with the uh, Explore Scientific and uh, the Explore Alliance presentation of How Do You Know? This is our 10th How Do You Know program, uh, which is great. And uh, I'm here with uh, Dr. Daniel Barth. Um, uh, I heard a little, uh, I, I, I saw in the chat here that you guys were hearing uh, low audio with the videos. And I have literally not changed anything from I, it was, <laughs> from the last program I ran. I just turned, I just, and the computer was still on. So I, I don't I can know. I confirm the low audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I went, I wonder if that, uh, uh, Jeff's saying this sound is good. So, yes. um, you, you know, um, it's live. It's live. <laughs> it's live. I may have to actually buy some hardware instead of working with software you know, to try to control the audio. So uh, it's a little pricey uh, to get it, but it's more affordable than ever. So I might look it into, uh, yeah. So I might look into a professional mixer or something like that. Yeah, so, I put a couple we'll thousand dollars into my home studio this year for COVID teach from home. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah. Two grand. Uh, oh, yeah. New yeah. PC, new monitors, new cameras, new microphone. Uh, new router. Uh, Are there, would, would you know, I mean, uh, I mean, you're a university professor and maybe you have to spend your own money, but uh, um, did uh, during COVID, did teachers 
in public schools get uh, additional materials to help them out with um, broadcasting and doing Zoom? You know, I don't know that. Um, I would bet it would have been extraordinarily minimalist. My experience with public school funding has never been a happy one. <laughs> um, it's all, I mean, I, I hear teachers complain about it all the time. And a lot of teachers have to bring in their own materials, which, oh yes. you know, which, I mean, your program is helping them out because, yes. you know, those That's one materials of the reasons why it's so successful. Yeah. You know, you, you, you're showing them how to do it for you know, a few dollars versus you right. know, having to buy something that's very expensive. So, yes, um, um, my public school teaching experience was um, at the beginning, the California lottery was funding education and we had a lot of money, but the uh, state government diverted those sources away, much like the Colorado River and it ran dry. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and uh, the last, I don't know, 12 or 15 years, most of the years, my budget was zero. Uh, I did get an initial budget to set up an astronomy program when I went to a, a new high school uh, in the district. The principal wanted me and recruited me and said, I have found X amount of money for you, uh, which was great. But my annual budget for maintenance, it was do it yourself. And if it was, it broke, you fix it. And for the physics and AP physics program, um, the budget was zero. And so I was very much up against it. And the whole origin of the low cost science initiative that runs all the way through astronomy for educators is, uh, was based on need is the, the necessity, uh, kind of like a depression era mentality. Mm -hmm use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without, um, kind of one of those ideas. And essentially, we often would do projects where we said, okay, what can we do? And we would look through catalogs. We would literally look through science catalogs. And I would say, okay, folks, let's look through a science catalog and look for some things that are cool that you think we could build it instead of buying it from these guys. And we would look through the Pasco catalog and other places. Sure. They would have things like, oh, here's a rubber band powered launcher for rockets made out of pool noodle foam. And uh, here's our little plywood board with an angle cut in it and right. a mimeographed handout, which you can copy. And it cost $195 plus shipping and handling. And I said, how much do you think we could build it for? Somebody said, oh, I got a bunch of pool noodles we don't use. They're a little moldy, but we can scrub them off. And uh, I got razor blades, we can cut them. And uh, my dad will, will give us some plywood. And so we, yeah. would, we would make stuff. And uh, the whole yeah. astronomy for educators, every activity is $1 per child or less, assuming you've got a group of 20. Because it's just like cooking. You can't cook for two uh, very economically. But if you're, if you're setting up, you could do uh, an activity for 20 kids for 20 bucks. Yeah. And I did it that way because STEM should not be simply for those who live in affluent areas. That's, that's a terrible idea. Right. Uh, the other thing is when funding fluctuates. You may be somewhere where you're flush this year and two years later, you know, yeah they're handing you a broom because they fired all the janitors and saying, Oh, your door is creaking. Here's some, you know, WD 40 and a screwdriver, fix it yourself. Yeah. Um, and I, that, that's a true story. It's tough on teachers. But I mean, thank God that the teachers out there are doing, you know, really they're on a personal mission, you know, Absolutely. and uh, they're not doing Absolutely. it to become rich, you know, so true. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's important. And I, you know, and I look at what you're doing. I mean, you've written this book on, on, uh, you know, and giving on, it away, giving it away. Exactly. <laughs> giving it away. I, and that's, I had, that's, uh, cool. that's cool. You know, but you know, I had someone on one of the, uh, I'm on about 50 different uh, teacher group pages, different yeah. media. And I had a guy said, you should stop selling your, oh, how did he put it? You should stop using this site for your side hustle and pushing you your expensive yeah. curriculum. Right. And a bunch of people said, he doesn't sell anything. He gives it away. 
And you should go to his, you know, you should go to the website. It's all free. There's not even any place. There's not even a Patreon to donate anything. I'm like, there you go. Um, it's a life of service, kids. Yeah. I <laughs> and uh, not that I wouldn't be happy to make a packet of money. Uh, but um, yeah, I've had so many people, Scott, so many people. They're not wired that way. You know, they're no. thinking of, of in, uh, in my, this is, I'm going to launch my 42nd year in education this August. And in my career, so many people, dozens and dozens of people have stepped in without being asked, without being prodded. Oh, right. hey, can I help you with this? Look, right. I got this. Can you use this? Oh, you know what? It's easier if you do it this way. And people have all through my career and you got to pay back. Yeah, you got to pay it back. And um, the uh, fun thing I just found out today, the university has approved a second section of the Astronomy for Educators program. So we'll have two sessions this fall. Congratulations. Great. That's great. Yeah. And the second section has been open two days. It's half full. Wow. So uh, that's because if you bug people to uh, the counselors and I have been bugging them for a while, put up a second section. And you kind of, this is, this is like a, it's, it's like put your money on a horse, right? If you, if you build it and they do not come, <laughs> you know, then you have egg all over your face. And yes, uh, right. uh, two days, it's half full and we have plenty of time. And I have no doubt that the classes, both of them will be full and uh, the observatory will be running this fall. Oh yeah. Yeah. Bonk, bonk, knock on wood. Able to, uh bring students to your observatory once you have yes. it all built and this, yes. uh, you know, more of this COVID uh, debacle has blown. Ah, uh, good grief. Yes. The, yep. uh, this is the way we've run the program for the last, uh, well, since 2015 when we started it. Mm -hmm. uh, so six years now, uh, students come out uh, to my hilltop home and we have this lovely lovely view milky way is naked eye orion's mm. nebula is naked eye uh andromeda is naked eye we are in about a bordel two and a half three depends on the the clarity of the night uh we can have bordel two easily after midnight uh and it's it's just it's fabulous and people come out and they say i didn't know there were so many stars yes yes virginia there's a lot of stars <laughs> yes so we're not doing stars today. We're not no, we're doing, doing stars. We're doing moons today. And I, I read through I read through your um, uh, you know the curriculum for this particular right, episode, up, which yeah. is episode 10. And I thought, well, you know, what am I going to learn new from Dr. Barth about Jupiter's moons? Okay. You're a hard sell because you're I, a very experienced fella. There's a ton of moons out there, okay, but <laughs> I don't know why I didn't think of this myself, but I didn't. Okay. That Jupiter's getting new moons. Oh, yes. Regularly, I guess. Regularly, okay. yes. Regularly is getting new moons. So brand new moons. Um, and uh, so I, I found that very interesting. And um, um, so, and, and I'm sure you're going to cover that here. So I'm, I'm going to yes. turn it over to you. Uh, and, uh, but first we do want to talk, we want to recognize our audience here. We have, uh, Mike Wiesner logged in first. How you doing, hey, Mike? Mike? Mike, Book Davies is with us. Cameron Gillis, howdy and happy Monday to all. Uh, Pekka Hautala, uh, good afternoon from Stockholm. Uh, Cam, uh, Stockholm Cam is waving back. Uh, Harold Locke. Happy Monday. Facebook didn't send an alert. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Oh, good. Hmm. Don't know. There's uh, one on the Astronomy for Educators page. Yeah. Martin Eastburn. Hey, Martin, I wanted to tell you, I did get your package of uh, those Sapphire slip covers and stuff like that. So I'm going to have to check those out. But um, uh, interesting material, Sapphire. You know, I, I had a watch. It had a Sapphire. Sapphire crystal. Yeah, yeah. yeah which is, but very cool. Thank you so much, Martin. That was very kind. Um, um, let's see. And who else is on with us? Book Davies, Jeff Wise, who could not hear the audio of the video. Um, I'll have to work on that more. Uh, I had some success last week and I thought it was done. And for some reason, things are not done. So I don't know why. 
No, technology is um, never done. <laughs> That's true. Um, who else here? Smaller group today of the regulars. We know there's people that just watch, but Daniel Yount says, dark sky, please. Um, Chris Larson, better late than never. Hello, everyone. Chris, thanks for joining in. And um, and that's it right now. So, uh, yeah, and Jeff is recognizing that the audio did work well last week. So we're, we're not sure what that is. Um, and Ollie's Astro is here. Thank you for checking in. Uh, and I also want to give a shout out to all the people who participated in Global Star Party 45, which was in celebration of International Astronomy Day. Um, want, want to give, you know, I was so thrilled to have uh, Doug Berger, the founder of International, or uh, the founder of Astronomy Day, which became <coughs> International Astronomy Day, which has become this worldwide movement. And so right. it was interesting to hear the backstory to that and how that all happened. But uh, it was just awesome to have the father founder of Astronomy there, uh, Astronomy Day there. So, um, and we're hoping that he comes back. So that'll be really cool. Yeah. Um, and with all that, I will turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Bart. Thank you. Um, my wife and I bought uh, a pair of um, the zero gravity reclining chairs for observing, for binocular observing. And of course, it's been cloudy all last week and it's going to rain all next week. So uh, if you were wondering if the buy a new telescope cloudy skies for a month rule holds, yes, even if you buy an observing chair, that rule seems to hold. Yeah, just don't be thinking about astronomy as you buy anything. That's right. That's Think right. about it, you know, months way down the road, then somehow turn your brain off and then make the buy. Yes. And I, uh, <laughs> we got two, another reason and, to have uh, it. we got two of these chairs and, uh, my darling was a little skeptical until she sat in one. Of, Ooh, it's really comfortable. Uh, so they're, they're really nice. I'm looking forward to doing some observing in them. So today, as we often do, we're going to be following in the footsteps of great astronomers. Uh, and we're going to take a look at the Galilean moons. And if you download the, uh, the handout for today, there you'll find it's, it's loaded with uh, references and footnotes and other things to lead you on your astronomy adventure. And I'm really hoping everyone uh, listening will go ahead and visit the website and download the Astronomy for Educators book and take the survey. Uh, I've been asked to do a uh, paper presentation to the National Association of Geoscience Teachers on the sculpting the moon surface in clay. Cool. And that's very exciting. Uh, so, and that's from both the uh, A Free program and here, how do you know? Uh, so we're gonna look at the Galilean moons. And of course, the funny thing, and I was telling Scott before the show, this dredges up so many issues with nomenclature naming in astronomy, which is just a big hot mess. But, uh, you know, I think if you discover a new kind of cricket or cockroach, you can name it as you wish. Mm. If you discover an, a new asteroid or comet, people will impose a committee on you. And uh, there's legendary stories about uh, who was it, the fellow who, Christie, who, Jeff Christie, who discovered Pluto's moon, Sharon? Oh, and, it was Christie, yeah. Yeah, Christie. Anyway, um, he uh, promised his wife he'd name it after her and <laughs> went searching through the mythology to find her name was Sharon. And he, so he, he got Sharon. Uh, he was like, I snuck it in, baby. There you go. Um, we have all sorts of oddities with moons. Galileo, of course, lived in an age of patronage. Uh, he was not wealthy. He was not a university employee. Uh, very few people were at that time. Uh, and uh, he basically hawked himself as an astrologer, astronomer, mathematician to the Medici family in, in uh, Italy and uh, Tuscany in particular. And he, uh, he worked for Cosimo de' Medici. And I think that's got to be one of the great names of all time. And he eventually, he originally named them Cosmica Sidera, Cosimo's stars. Cool. And uh, he realized very shortly that they were really moons. And for a long time, they were known as the Medician moons. 
and or just Jupiter's moons. And we've always thought, oh, Galileo's, they, they've always been the Galilean moons, but that's not true. It was relatively recently, these were discovered in 1610. They weren't called the Galilean moons until 1892. Amalthea, the fifth moon of Jupiter was discovered in 1892. And so after that, there was this distinction between here's the ones Galileo discovered, here's the new one. Little did they know that Amalthea was, it's, it's like the relative who says, I'm coming to visit and shows up with a giant minibus with 14 relatives inside. Hi, we're all here. <laughs> uh, Jupiter depends on who you look. It's, it's different references disagree. Somewhere between 75 and 85 moons. Hmm. And uh, so the number of moons around uh, Jupiter is truly prodigious. And I like to describe the situation with Jupiter and moons. It's very much like a four-year-old with Happy Meals. They're always losing the old ones, getting the new ones, and destroying some and ripping them apart. Uh, and Jupiter does all these things. Uh, Jupiter's massive gravitational field captures small objects from the uh, asteroid belt all the time. Matter of fact, there's a group of, uh, there's several groups, but they are known as retrograde moons and they orbit in the opposite direction. And it's kind of like getting on the wrong ramp of the freeway. you got to realize that these things are not going to be permanent residents orbiting the wrong way compared to everything else. Um, and these are obviously captures. So are they a moon if they're captured? Are they only a moon if they're formed? Are there different processes? Are there some that are legal for forming a moon and some that are not? Um, but I kind of like the current convention. If it orbits Jupiter, it's a moon. Although there are a lot, I went and looked, there are lots of synonyms. <laughs> and uh, the whole thing about the names of moons, they weren't named individually. Uh, until much later, it was uh, <clears throat> it was Marius uh, and uh, a guy named Marius who suggested naming them after the lovers of Zeus. Zeus, as you know, if you've studied Greek mythology, a great philanderer. He had his wife Hera, but was always stepping out on her. And so uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto were several of the young lovers of Zeus. And so this name was suggested uh, purportedly by Kepler, who was a contemporary of Galileo as well. And so this crazy, the, uh, the most common number I found for the number of moons is 79 identified moons, but only 53 are named. Uh, it's kind of like if you have that many children, what do you name them all? <laughs> Uh, and so we know that there's, there's two processes going on. There is, well, actually three, there's gravitational capture. And this is fairly easy to understand. Uh, an object gets bumped, goes in, uh, or actually from the asteroid belt wanders out and in wandering out, it slows down, right? Because it's using energy to move farther away from the sun. And that makes it easier to be captured by uh, a big planet like Jupiter. The miracle is that Mars has two captured moons and there's questions about, wow, how did that happen? Tiny Mars. Uh, but these, uh, this capture is one thing. There's another thing going on. Uh, there's a Roche process going on. Uh, Scott, you may know Edouard Roche. He's a, uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm slaughtering the French. My apologies to those of you Francophiles and French speakers out there. I do not parley boo really. But Edouard Roche was a, uh, an astronomer in the uh, 17, 1800s, 1800s. And uh, during this whole question about what is Saturn's uh, ring made of? And it was Maxwell who proved Saturn's ring could be neither solid nor liquid nor gas. He said if it was solid, the thinness and the diameter, the torsional forces would rip it apart. If it was liquid, it would evaporate. And if it was a gas, it would have dispersed. It wouldn't confine itself. And so uh, Maxwell first thought, oh, it's made of little particles. 
Uh, and I found a new name for those, Scott. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a website calling little particles of Saturn, not ring particles, but ringlings. Ringlings. Uh, ringlings. Uh, that's a Barnum and Bailey hit, I just think. Sorry, I like that joke. Terrible joke. But like um, yeah, so you've got this capture. Roche basically says, gee, if you get something too close to a planet, the gravitation will tear it apart and shred it. Uh, the current thinking is that Saturn's rings were originally an icy moon about 250 to 300 kilometers wide. And it's been shredded. The average size of a uh, ringling in Saturn's rings, a ring particle, is about 15 to 20 centimeters. Now, of course, there's very large pieces and dust sized pieces as well. But take a 250 kilometer wide moon and shred it into softball sized pieces. That's an astonishingly efficient destructive process. Uh, that's no fooling. And uh, we see this Roche process. We've all heard of spaghettification, right? If you fall into a black hole, the tidal forces will stretch you apart. Essentially the same thing happens, but there's a, that's called the Roche limit. And if you calculate the Roche limit for Saturn, you realize with great joy and delight in mathematics that the rings begin where the Roche limit is. Mm -hmm. So they, they fill up the Roche limit, but there's a second Roche limit. That's referred to as the limit of stability. Oh. This gravitational Roche limit, if a moon gets, how far away, how far out can you have a moon? And Roche said, Roche explored this process in the late 1700s. And he realized that, oh, if the moon is far enough away, the gravitational forces from the sun will be approximately equal to the gravitational forces of the planet. And essentially it's balanced on a knife's edge and all it takes is one push and away it drifts. Our moon is in a process of migrating away. We're gonna do a whole uh, program on tides and the motion of a moon. This will be coming up in future, not next week, but I have it on the list. Our moon someday, and it's kind of a race. Will it escape before the sun goes uh, goes red giant and cooks us all? Uh, perhaps it's a close race, but our moon is spiraling away. And eventually in a system like that, the moon would get far enough away where the gravitation would no longer hold it. That's hmm. going to be a bad day because most moons which get lost by a Roche process within about 100 orbits re-impact the original planet. Because guess what? You're sharing an orbit with something much bigger than you, with a much larger gravitational field than you. Mm. And now you're not bound and therefore safe. Now you're wandering around in traffic without a seatbelt or an airbag. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really good chance that when moons get lost, they're often reacquired in a, uh, an impactful way. Uh, so we've got this process, Jupiter shreds moons with the Roche process, Jupiter acquires moons through gravitational capture, and Jupiter loses moons because they wander out to the gravitational limit of stability. It turns out you can't have a moon wherever you like. There's feng shui going on here. You cannot have a moon wherever you want to. Uh, and like I said, we go and we look at the moons, the Galilean moons of Jupiter. <clears throat> Any place else in our solar system, they would be planets. They would be full-fledged planets. Mm -hmm. uh, Ganymede is larger than Mercury. Uh, our moon, and I'm going to go ahead and share a photo because I've got so many cool photos today. Cool. Uh, I've got so many cool photos, which is lots of fun. So I'm going to share a screen with our viewers. There we go. And uh, this is obviously a composite photo. <laughs> they don't line up in nice curves yeah, like this. That's a great lineup there. Isn't it though? And at the bottom, we have very colorful Io and then Europa, uh, the ocean planet with a permanent icy crust. And then we have Ganymede. And then we have Callisto, which... Uh, the surface is uh, really, really ancient. 
Callisto is kind of this frozen body. But when we look at this, we realize, oh, well, wow. We have standard kind of uh, terrestrial volcanism on Io. Uh, a lot of sulfur rich rock, but indeed it is silicate volcanism. You go out a little farther to Europa and we have cryovolcanism. And both of these worlds, I'll call them worlds, they're big enough. You must be this tall to ride this ride. Uh, both of these worlds, Io and Europa, they should be geologically dead, like our moon. They are, our moon would be in between the two in terms of size. Our moon is effectively geologically dead. There are people who will haggle about, oh, there may be outgassing and et cetera, et cetera. But the moon's core has been solid for a long, long time. The same thing with Mars, no plate tectonics. And Mars is pretty much geologically dead. And Mars is bigger than any of these. Why aren't they dead? Why aren't you dead yet? It sounds like a, a hard boiled detective movie or a horror film or something. Um, but the reason they aren't dead yet is that they orbit Jupiter. And they're using Jupiter's tremendous gravitational energy to stay young, to stay molten inside. And the reason, of course, is this Roche effect. As these moons are on an elliptical orbit, and when they get closer to Jupiter, they are in fact stretched. And then when they move away, they relax into a more spherical shape. They are all tidally locked. Jupiter's gravitational field is tremendous and locks them tidally. So one side faces Jupiter all the time. And so they're alternately stretched and relaxed, stretched and relaxed. And if you've done this crazy thing, if you, you know, if you're like me, if you always have to talk with your hands, sometimes haven't we all done this sit here and bend a paper clip back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until it breaks. And then if you touch the end, you realize, wow, it's really hot from we've been bending and stretching it and the molecules inside have been rubbing against each other and we're creating frictional heating. Same thing's going on on Io. <clears throat> and this gravitational stretching is putting enough energy into the planet that Io is the volcanic wonderland of the solar system. It is the most volcanic place we know. Uh, it was so exciting. I'm sure you remember, Scott, we launched the Voyager probes in 77. Yes. And about a uh, couple, three years later, it was like 80, 81. And oh my gosh, we're seeing plumes of volcanic material on Io. Oh my gosh, there's an active volcano on another world. And it was a huge discovery. Oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, we look at, <clears throat> at uh, Io and it, it kind of looks like kind of a Halloween candy. It looks like it's been glazed with all sorts of different colors of frosting because it's got all, sulfur is one of the most colorful elements. It makes all kinds of different chemical reactions and can produce all kinds of colors. So it's a lot of sulfur rich rock. And so you get all these lovely different colors. Europa is different. Europa has a world wrapping ocean. It is literally the water world. But it's in the outer solar system. And so it's very cold and the surface is permanently frozen. But the same stretching action that heats the interior of Europa enough to keep those oceans liquid and people, different theories, oceans a mile deep, 60 miles deep. There's, there's all sorts of different, uh, it's a lot of water, no matter how you slice it. Right. But this stretching, Gee, surprise, glaciers flow and crack. And when they do, when they spread apart and crack apart, the water under pressure from the inside and the, the surface, there's no atmosphere to speak of on, on Europa. Perhaps like the moon, it's tiny little microbars of, of gas, but basically no atmosphere. So it's zero pressure outside. And it's like releasing a balloon. Uh, tons of water are ejected. These plumes, uh, the video we let in with said, you're talking two kilotons of water each time a geyser goes kapush, uh, which is a lot of water. And uh, of course, everywhere on our planet, everywhere there is water, there is life. 
Uh, we have life around uh, smoking vents at the bottom of the Pacific, six miles down. And there's no oxygen to speak of. There's no sunlight at all. And they are doing sulfur respiration and all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, Io tells us there's a lot of sulfur in the system. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to design the nuclear powered, it sets on the surface and gets hot and melts through the ice and then goes swimming with a camera and a flashlight. Elon Musk, there's your challenge for 2022. Uh, or maybe we should do it, Scott. I don't know, I don't have deep pockets like that. But um, a lot of interesting places in our solar system look for life. Ganymede, rocky, and then uh, Callisto, even more rock. So you should go out, or excuse me, more ice. You should go out, less rock, more ice. And it's one of the interesting things when we look at this as a, uh, when we look at the moons of Jupiter, we're really seeing uh, a mini solar system. We're really seeing a little solar system, which is really quite fascinating. <clears throat> we know a lot more about forming solar systems now than we did when I was young. Uh, I remember having a teacher tell me, there are no other worlds but these nine. There is only life in one place. The universe is sterile except for here. There aren't any other planets. No other stars have planets. And the theory that was in my textbook, I remember this, I, I don't know how old I was, I was quite young, was that uh, two stars had to pass really close and the gravitational tidal forces ripped off enough of the sun that it coagulated and then formed planets. Did you ever see that? The close pass planetary formation theory? No. And I mean, uh, it could be, I guess, you know, might be, person. but you would only have Jovian type planets, probably hydrogen, helium. <clears throat> and how do you get that close without destroying each other? So under that, that was a theory that was meant to say that planets are really rare and maybe there might be another dozen stars in our galaxy that might have wow. planets. We were really That's unique. Uh, but that, that kind of goes back to, you know, people thinking that we're somehow at the center of the universe, right? There couldn't possibly be other planets around out of the stars. This is a rare thing, you know, but right. I guess what we find out, you know, science has taught us these great observations, you know, Shapley uh, figuring out that, hey, we're, we're not, uh, we're not in the center of the Milky Way anymore. Okay. We're not in the center of the galaxy. Uh, <coughs> You know, uh, so we find out that we're not in a very special part of the galaxy. We don't have a very special star. We're in a very, con you know, and now we're starting to find out that there's planets around stars like cockroaches, you know. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a very common thing. And, you know, I personally think that we're going to find out that there are trillions and trillions and trillions of planets just in our galaxy. And yes. that all galaxies and stars are filled with planets. Yes. So, with the, you know, what you're, what you're referring moons. to is called the Copernican principle. Okay. Which simply stated, if you think you're special, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, did he but, tell a student that? I mean, was... Yeah. That... Yeah, I, I do. Uh, in a cosmological sense, <laughs> if you think you're special, you're wrong. Uh, right. <clears throat> and... Uh, the I, Copernicus took us out of the center of the universe and said, no, Earth is just a planet. Well, this has to be a really special star. No, it's just a, a yellow dwarf. It's, it's not special. There are lots. Well, planets are special. And no, it now turns that when no. stars form, stars form planets the way an infant in the womb forms fingers and toes. It's part of the automatic self-assembling process unless something goes disastrously wrong. You know, a neutron star comes winging through your, your planetary disk, I suppose all bets are off. But generally speaking, um, when a star forms, the material spreads out and flattens. It's a centripetal, centrifugal yeah. effect. Uh, disks swarm and they flatten and they thin out. And the farther out you go, the less heat you have. And so, we say, oh, well, 
Planets form from particles colliding and sticking together. This is accretion is the name for the process. So if we have accretion, why do we have a really rocky metallic planet in Mercury? And then we have a bunch of terrestrial rocky planets out to about Mars. And then we have gas giants. And then we have ice giants. And then we have the ice worlds like Pluto and the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt and et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you think about it, as you get farther and farther away, different things as they get into a colder environment, crystallize out and become solid. They're now particles, they can collide, they can stick. And so if you look at this, what generally happens is things which have higher density and higher melting point crystallize closer to a star. And so you tend to have metals, heavy metals are close in, rocks are next. And after the rocks, and if you look at the melting point, metals, four to 5,000 Fahrenheit, rocks, one to 2,000 Fahrenheit, and then you get out past Mars, you get out into the outer solar system. Oh, well, Jupiter got to be big enough, has this icy rocky core that gets big enough. Jupiter formed fast enough that it starts holding hydrogen and helium. Anybody who's played with a helium balloon knows that the Earth's atmosphere cannot hold helium. Our gravity is too light and helium floats to the top of the atmosphere. Your balloon will burst and the helium will be lost to space. If you buy a helium balloon at a carnival and let it go, that helium is gone forever. That helium will never come back <clears throat> and it will go up into the stratosphere, ionosphere, exosphere, and solar radiation will give it a kick and it will become part of the interplanetary medium again. Well, <clears throat> if you look at the density of planets as we go farther out, they tend to become less dense. The gas giants are kind of an exception to this because when you get big enough, you can hold helium. There's lots and lots of material. Um, it's kind of like drink from a fire hose problem. When Jupiter and Saturn got big enough to hold helium and hydrogen, the amount of material they were scooping in gravitationally just became, and they ballooned out very quickly, supersized me. Uh, they had a feeding problem and it only stopped when the sun ignited and blew off the gas and dust layers and the planets essentially stopped feeding. So accretion stops when the star ignites violently and clears out the dust and material which are feeding planetary formation gets blasted out. Mm -hmm. We see this process or evidence of it around Jupiter. We think Jupiter had a dusty protoplanetary disk just like the sun. And we look at these Galilean moons and we the theory is called the co-formation theory. Planets are co-formed with a star. It's part of the natural process of the formation of the dusty ring, the temperature gradient, the different materials crystallizing out. We see that there's a density gradient with the Galilean satellites. Io has a density of about three and a half grams per cubic centimeter, just like the moon. It's essentially the same density as stone. And then you get farther out and the densities continue to drop. So you get farther out and you find that, oh, Io is 3.5. Uh, Callisto has only 1.8 grams per cubic centimeter, which basically says this is ice with some rocks mixed in. Uh, Callisto has a structure that's very similar to a comet. It's, uh, it's a rocky snowball. Remember that? Yes. Definition of comet. We kind of moved beyond that now, but it fits fairly well for yeah. Fred, worlds like Pluto Fred, and Callisto. Fred, um, dirty snowball theory. <clears throat> the dirty snowball theory, yes. Yep. And uh, we see that <laughs> Pluto and Charon uh, have these low densities, and so does Callisto. And they are primarily ice, but they have a certain percentage of rock, probably no metal at all. Hmm. Uh, and it's really kind of cool. So we look at this system of moons around Jupiter and we realize, oh, here we have a solar system in miniature. We've sometimes, have you heard of Jupiter, Scott, referred to as a failed star? 
Yes. As a brown dwarf, right? Right. Uh, yeah. If Jupiter were roughly 1.5 to two times its diameter, that would give it a mass of about 70 to 80 Jupiters. And you think, oh, 80 times bigger, that's a lot. Not when you're feeding on hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe. Uh, had Jupiter had more time, had our sun not ignited prematurely, uh, we would have been in a binary star system. And we know now that binary systems are common. <clears throat> binary stars, by some estimates, make up uh, 60 to 65% of all stars in our galaxy are involved in some sort of a binary or multiple arrangement. Uh, Pollux, is, is it Pollux or Castor? It's in Gemini. Uh, but either way, it's a six star system. You have a central binary pair, you have a second binary pair, which is orbiting fairly close in with about a 20 year period. And then you have another binary pair that's way out there that has a 20,000 year period. And so uh, I think it's Castor, it has a, it's a six star system, which is crazy. It's, it's enormous, it's wonderful. So if Jupiter is a failed star, it's not a failed solar system. Nope. Because it has, it has its own collection of planets. It has primary planets. It has minor planets. It has its own little asteroid belt. Uh, and they're all controlled by its gravitational field. Yeah. Exactly as uh, the solar system is controlled by the sun's <coughs> uh, gravitational field. Now, if you want to get out and observe, and I'm going to put up another photo. And uh, I would like to take credit for this photo, but I cannot. <clears throat> this is not mine. This is a public domain photograph that was on the web. And uh, this would correspond to roughly the best seeing I've ever had with Jupiter with a really nice refractor. Wow. Yeah. Uh, nice. <clears throat> and um, I'm sure this is one of the uh, stacked photographs, right? Dozens, sometimes hundreds of frames. And then they're stacked together. They pick the best ones. And you start to see a couple of things here. First of all, for those of you out there who are new to astronomy, your view of Jupiter is likely not going to be this lovely. <laughs> Sorry, kids. Uh, to have a view like this, you need either a super premium refractor or you need a big, I'm talking 12 to 24 inch reflector. You need a big instrument to resolve this kind of detail. Um, you can definitely, I've definitely seen these, and by the way, dark ones are called belts, light ones are called zones. Uh, they're grouped together and called bands, but the two dark belts, the equatorial belts on Jupiter, yes, absolutely, you can see them. The white zone that splits them, the equatorial zone, Yes, absolutely. Most telescopes will show you this. We've got, and I believe this is the Southern Hemisphere, uh, we've got some nice banding structure in the Southern Hemisphere. We've got some darkening in the Northern Hemisphere. And all these things, Scott, you can expect to see. You can see most of that with a six inch Dobsonian. Uh, is it yes. going to be clear all the time? No you're looking up through an ocean of air that's turbulent, it swims. This is going to be that moment of clarity where you go, wow, and somebody else says, let me see. And then the, the swim has started again and the image is gone. The other thing this shows is all the moons appear as disks. You have to have a very fine instrument indeed to resolve the Galilean moons as disks. You're talking something, yes, it's the size of Mercury, but it's half a billion miles away. The distance is incredible. And the, uh, the resolution that you need uh, is sub arc second resolution. You need really, really fine seeing in a fine instrument. I've done it. I've seen the moons as disks. Uh, the other thing here is you see some color variation. Io appears more orange, Europa and Ganymede appear with a slight greenish hue, Callisto appears kind of a neutral white, 
I've never seen color. This is not a problem with your telescope. This is how your eyes are made. We have two kinds of cells in our retinas called rods and cones. Rods uh, give us our black and white vision. They help us detect edges and boundaries. Rods are about mm, 100 to 200 times more sensitive to light than the cones. The cones require a lot more light and they help us detect color. That's why when we look through a telescope, Scott, unless you're in a truly large instrument, you're talking something on the order of half meter size or larger, 20 inch, 24 inch, 36 inch, then you're going to see color. You're going to see lots of fun colors in nebulae and uh, uh, planetary nebula and all sorts of fun things, planets. But with a more modest scope, which most of us have, you know, 100 millimeter, six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, you're just, your eye is not going to detect color. Your camera can, but your eye cannot. So part of it, we don't want people to go, ooh, ooh, I want to see a picture like I saw on How Do You Know? Uh, you can take a photograph like this, but it takes an enormous amount of skill and knowledge to get a photograph like this. But what's interesting, notice the equatorial plane here, and oh, look, all of the Galilean satellites are lined up with Jupiter's equatorial belts. They all exist directly around the equator. Yes, there's some tilting, but it's very minor. It's a few degrees. And this is another indication that Jupiter's satellites were co-formed in a dusty disk, which would have been oriented exactly around Jupiter's equator, just as our solar system is oriented from a disk from which it formed, which was belted right around the sun's equator. And this is just the physics of rotating systems and gravitation makes these flat disks. Galaxies do the same thing. And so when we're looking and somebody often says, now, how do I know which ones are moons? Well, one of the ways we tell is we look at Jupiter first and we go, oh, okay. Uh, I want to see which way the stripes are going. And then I want to look along that line and see. And if you're seeing something up here and it's way away from the equatorial belt, it's not a moon, it's a star. Doesn't matter. Oh, I, I saw there's one right here. Oh, I'm like, nope, if it's not, if it's that close, absolutely, it's going to be right in line with the equator. So that's something we need to know when we look. Now, when you get a nice picture like this, Scott, one of the fun things to do, let's identify which moons are which. Why not? And that's lots of fun and we can see which moons are which, but when we're looking for which moons are which, one of the things we have to be aware of, what is our telescope doing to the image? Different telescopes change images differently. So I, I found some, I did some, I did some photo processing and these are manipulated images. Now, one of the things I recommend to people, take your telescope out during the day, look at a traffic sign. Why? Because it's obvious if it's right side up, if it's upside down, it's obviously, if it's mirror reversed, it's obvious, right? right. This is the way a stop sign would look through a pair of binoculars. Binoculars use pairs of prisms and the light is reflected many times in order to remove all the inversions that the lens has put in. Right. So binoculars give us what we call an orthographic view. Everything's right side up, right is right, left is left, and we can read it and it's just fine. Now, if we have a Dobsonian, <laughs> if we have a Dobsonian, a Dobsonian will generally invert things. So yes, it's, not been mirror image flipped, it's just been flipped on the vertical axis. Right. Which has to do with the way the well, mirror, it does, there's two mirrors. If you had, if you had your eyepiece, uh, usually on a Dobsonian, you have the eyepiece off to the side, okay? Which is going to make this upside down, backwards, 
kind of view. If right. you put the eyepiece at 12 o'clock high, right. okay, on a Newtonian telescope, and, and look and, get get, this view and cradle it, you know, you cradle it like, like you put the tube under your arm and then run your eyes straight down so that the, right. the open end is facing like that and the eyepiece is pointing straight up, you will get a right side up view, but still mirror reverse. Correct. So, right? Uh Yes, I. But no I, one looks through a, a Dobsonian or a Newtonian telescope like that. I don't know if you remember, but years ago, the Parks Company made a little 114 reflector that was designed to mount on a regular camera tripod. It was very wobbly, oh. not very satisfactory, but yes. you could crate it, cradle it. The Edmund, uh, oh, what's the Edmund scope that had the ball? Yeah, for yeah, the um, AstroScan. The AstroScan, which was kind of, you could cradle it and then look through it. And uh, I was trying, somebody brought their telescope back I, when I worked for Scope City. It's broken. The image has flipped around. And I said, yeah. no, no, uh, it's a mirror. And they didn't, they, we, we looked through this telescope. They didn't believe me. I said, okay, come on, come on back here into the back, into the, into the restroom. Now, look at the mirror over the sink. Hold up your right hand. <laughs> which hand is being held up in the mirror? He says, my right hand. I'm like, no, which side of your body? He says, it's on the left. Like, ah, <laughs> what is this magic? Uh, so there's a Dobsonian view. <laughs> if you have a refractor or a Schmidt Cassegrain, you're not only inverted, you're reversed. And of course, uh, you can get even screwier. You can have a refractor with the diagonal is not vertical, where it's cocked over and then things get all rotated around. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter in space, right? I mean, it doesn't matter in space. It does matter when you're using a map. Yeah. The Sky and Telescope app for, and I put a link in the uh, handout. I hope you'll download it. Their link has this thing. Oh, you're identifying the moons of Jupiter? Here's a tab for a Dobsonian, a refractor, uh, a, a Schmidt Cassegrain. And here's, if you're looking with binoculars, so you can identify what you see. And I was struggling with this. I had taken some photographs and it was, I was out with my refractor looking at the moon, held my cell phone up because I'm not very much of an astrophotographer. I'm like, well, let's see what I can do here. And I took some photos and then I was looking through, uh, I don't have it. Yes, I do. I have it on the table here. Um, People sent me and they said, what's the good atlas to use if you're studying the moon? Well, the, uh, this is the Hatfield Photographic Lunar Atlas. This was developed for the uh, Apollo astronauts in the 60s. It's still in print today, which tells you that it's really, really uh, useful and easy to use. That's published by Springer. And this is the Atlas of the Moon by Antonin Ruckel. And I'm sure I'm massacring oh, yeah. his name. My yeah. apologies. Is He's it our... Ruckel? No uh, don't know. I've never actually had had it corrected one way or the other, but yeah, uh, but, but this is uh, a L E or something like that, right? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. uh, R U K L, and the U has an umlaut over oh, it. Oh, okay, there we go. And this is published by Sky Publishing. This is more expensive and it's more difficult to use, but it has so much detail. Yeah. Well, if you go and you look at Jupiter and you take a photograph, you get your cell phone, I'm putting it to the eyepiece, click, there's Jupiter. Which moons are which? Well, one of the interesting things, you need to take your telescope out, take a photograph of a stop sign with your cell phone and see which way things are reversed. Because the moons are going to show up as points of light. And you may, with a quickie photograph, get some banding on Jupiter, but not very much. And so if you take four dots around a circle and you flip it around or flip it upside down, it looks much the same. Unlike a stop sign, it's not obvious. So you need to have some care if you're going to be serious and have a look at these things. So right now, it's really lovely. Jupiter is rising pre-dawn, which is really, uh, if you're hardcore about it, and I'm that kind of guy, I hope you're that kind of person too. Uh, if you're getting out in the early AM, it's one of the best times to observe. 
Everything has been cooled off for hours. So quiet, yeah. The it's atmosphere quiet. is still, it's quiet. You're unlikely to have people coming up. Is that a telescope? What you looking at? How many power is that? <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the seeing is really lovely. Now, as we go through the summer, Jupiter will be rising. Jupiter and Saturn. Saturn's about an hour ahead of Jupiter. They'll be rising about, they'll be rising earlier each day. So that by the time we get to uh, July, it'll be like 11 o'clock. By the time we hit August, Jupiter will be a sunset planet. It will be yeah. visible right at sunset. Jupiter hits opposition. Uh, and here's another image you're not going to see through your eyepiece. Uh, this is a Hubble shot. Don't expect this level oh, yeah. of clarity. Right. And uh, you can see crazy festoons. And this, we're actually looking at an eclipse on another planet. You can pick this up, Scott. You can do it. Jupiter is quite bright. The shadow is inky black. It's perfectly round. Unlike all these organic swirly features that are here, this is a geometrically perfect circle. And the other interesting thing, you'll notice that, oh, the size of the shadow is exactly the size of the moon that makes it because half a billion miles away, the sunlight is essentially parallel rays. So yeah. there's no distortion of the shadow. And I have accomplished this. This is a wonderful challenge if you have uh, a high quality scope or a large scope. Uh, if you have a 10 inch Dobsonian, you can accomplish this. If you have a five inch refractor, you can accomplish this. And uh, be kind of interesting, how small a telescope could you use and still capture these, uh, the shadow of one of the moons. Io is the easiest because it's so close to Jupiter that the moon and the shadow are often visible at the same time. If Io is coming here and it's coming around the front, Io will still be out here beyond the limb and you'll start to see the shadow crossing the planet. So you'll be able to see once Io gets onto the interior of Jupiter, it's bright, the planet's bright, hmm, much harder to pick out. Hmm. But this dark shadow is something, and you're actually watching a solar eclipse on yeah. another planet. Yeah. It's cool. On it another is. planet, which That's is fun. just, it's its an astoundingly yeah. cool and, and you event. And move over that period, that short period of time, you know, a couple hours, not not even a couple hours, you can see it move. Um, yes. It, uh, it gives you this feeling that, uh, you know, uh, because it's easy to get the feeling of the fixed stars of the heavens and stuff, even though everything's moving all over the place. Um, uh, but you, but you can see it in within what feels like real time to you. And right. uh, um, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but no, anyways, it is. It makes it makes the solar system come alive for you. you it know? is in real time. Yeah. And the other thing I've done for our friends, and this is something that I do regularly for my classes, but I haven't done it for our how do you know audience. I've included, there are apps and I included some links, but I think this is more fun. I included an observation chart for go. Jupiter and its moons. Yeah. And uh, there's a printable page. If you download the handout this week, there's a printable page with I think five or six of these charts. And you'll notice that we have a disc of Jupiter and then we have two thin gray lines, which give us, oh, this is, I don't know if you ever get a moon of Jupiter that's going to be up above the North Pole or down below the South Pole. I suppose you might be able to do that, but most of the time they're here. And what I've done with this center line, it's marked off in Jupiter diameters. And ah. this chart is big enough. It goes out to 13 Jupiter diameters and that's as far as Callisto goes. Hmm. So this chart will let you record all of your moons precisely, accurately. How many Jupiter diameters are they out? And that's fairly easy to estimate. And are they above or below the equatorial belt? How far? 
And it's interesting as you work at it and as you take some time and do a little better, you'll find out that your observing skills improve. A telescope is much like a violin. It's not a television that you just press the button and the picture is there and you sit back passively and, oh, I'm, I'm watching Grey's Anatomy or House or Game of Thrones. No, 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 no. A telescope is an instrument like a violin. It works with your eye. The better your eye, the better your mind, the greater your concentration, the more you will see. If you are patient at the eyepiece and they're not just, oh yeah, it's the moons. What's next? When I have friends over, telescope night and they're not astronomy people, they're like, oh yeah, it's Jupiter, what's next? Yeah. And they, they want this, change the channel, when's the commercial? What's the next program? Uh, the idea of saying, no, no, we're, we're going to watch Jupiter and its moons for a couple, three hours tonight. Yeah. Yeah. That would not be a crowd pleaser. Yeah, but yeah. in fact, well, for the enthusiast, no they would have no problem going to the Grand Canyon yes. and looking at that all day, you know, to see a sunrise, a sunset, the colors changing, these kinds of things, you know. Uh, but uh, what you're talking about, there was a Chevy Chase uh, vacation movie where he okay. takes them all. It's not Chevy Chase. It is uh, Rat Race. Okay. And, okay. And there's this scene where <laughs> I can't remember who the act actor is, but they're at the Grand Canyon with a family and they're all looking and he's going, uh-huh, it's great. And he wants them to go and they, you know, so... Uh, I saw it when I I, went I don't to know of anybody who would actually do that. But, oh yes, I went but to they Meteor do it Crater. at the IPs. They do. I went know? to Meteor Crater with my son a few years ago and we're out on the the observation balcony yeah. there. Yeah. And he and I are just like, oh my gosh, wow. Right. And I hear this, I don't know, 12, 14 year old. Well, yeah, okay, it's a really big hole. Can we go now? <laughs> Honest to goodness. Yeah. And I just like, <laughs> I'm kind of laughing into my hand because I don't. And, and the rest of the kids and the mom are all like, yeah, Billy's right. It's a really big hole, John. Can we go now? And wow. uh, we're John. <laughs> I know. And I'm just thinking, you know, this is a guy who's probably wrangled for years to get his, oh, yeah. to right. get here and like, come on, we're going to the Grand Canyon anyway. Let's stop off. It'll be cool. Right. Because he's an enthusiast. He was clearly an enthusiast sure. and his family was not. Not. Yeah. But those of us in the How You Know audience, many of us are enthusiasts or would like to learn to be enthusiasts. This is a pathway forward. So if I scroll down here to the yep. next page, oh, look, one, two, and here's a, here's a page with five or six of these little charts. And yeah. each one, you can please record cool. your date, your time. Location is good. Uh, right. I have uh, I have a permanent observing log, uh, and it has yay. It has a print of constellations on it. I have a permanent observing log. Um, it's well, just go ahead and pick yourself up a little, uh, you know, one dollar composition notebook. You find them all over right. in stores for school supplies are sold. And this is my observatory. This is my observing book. And you can go ahead and cut these out and paste them in. Oh, wow, look at this. I, and I saw Jupiter and here it was. And I was using an eight inch daub and a nine millimeter eyepiece. And the magnification was 112 power. And, uh, you know, it's worth these memories that we save. Not only are we participating in the scientific tradition of observation and recording data accurately, citizen science, but we're preserving a record of what we've done in the hobby which is really, it's, it's kind of a next level activity that's really fulfilling. And many people get a telescope, but they never write anything down. I would encourage you, you want a new accessory for your telescope, go buy a $1.95 uh, notebook. And right, yeah, uh, your observations, right. Well, it's fun. A, it a is a little more upscale, but you know. Observations later and, and yeah can relive that experience that you exactly have. and you can compare oh you're getting a new scope yeah go back and look what did i see with the old you know 114 millimeter reflector and now i have a 127 
explore scientific refractor and what's the difference now i have a 12 inch daub what's the difference i have two different telescopes mm -hmm. eh, different telescopes show you different things so we're looking at this but the other thing we can do and i promised everybody this last week and i said you know you can use jupiter's moons to prove prove kepler's laws of planetary motion kepler of course said all planets go in ellipses that's the first law planets sweep out equal areas in equal time what's that about we had a show about this earlier oh as planets fall in they speed up and as they move away they slow down so you have a short radius large arc long radius small arc surprise the the uh areas are always equal Feynman actually just for fun one time did something no one had ever done he took Kepler's laws and deduced geometrically without calculus the laws of Newton's laws of gravitation from Kepler uh, which is really it's, uh, there's a book on it called Feynman's last lost lecture Feynman's lost lecture really fascinating um, so but the third law the third law, and I'm putting it up here, and it's really fantastic. And I see we're running a little long, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave this as an exercise for the interested student. Uh, it turns out for all planets, the period that's the time it takes to go around. The Earth is one year, Jupiter's twelve, uh, Io is like one point eight days, uh, Callisto's sixteen, almost seventeen days. But the square of the period is always proportional to the cube of the orbital radius. And so because they are always true for all planets, we can set them equal to each other in this way. And you can go ahead and take the orbital distance data from NASA, which is quite accurate. We have a chart in the handout. And you can go ahead and say, oh, let's solve if we have Io, if we take Io is known, here's period one radius one, can we work out theoretically from the math, the periods of the other Jovian, the Galilean satellites, you can, and it works very nicely. The math comes out very satisfyingly. It's not really hard. It's there's some square roots in there, but that's what, sixth grade, seventh grade math. And uh, for those of you, math makes you cry. No, you don't have to, but I encourage you to give it a go. And uh, if anybody is like, oh no, post a solution. If you put in the notes, you want to see a solution for at least one of the moons, I'll post one worked out in detail for you. But uh, I'm hoping that all of our folks will get out and get out in the morning. And as Jupiter becomes more of a thing in the early evening sky, if it gets out earlier and earlier, I want you, I want to challenge you all to get out, take your telescope, try something new, observe and record. And record. Don't just observe and enjoy. Observe and record. Go buy that new accessory for your telescope. Go buy yourself a buck ninety-five composition notebook and a new ballpoint pen. Uh, I always record in pen. If if you like to erase, get a pencil. But go out there and uh, print out some of these observing sheets and give them a go. When we come back next time, Scott, we're going to tackle something that American schools, in particular and really schools worldwide do a really terrible job of teaching mm. uh -oh. big numbers. We're gonna do a fun activity called million, billion, trillion. And I'm going to promise that I will get Scott the handout early uh, because you can have some supplies and you can follow along with us and you can see what, what is a million? look like? What's a billion look like in comparison? And how big really is a trillion? Because we, we have flash drives and we have memory and computers and we throw around terms like kilobyte, megabyte, terabyte, hard drive, petabyte, you know, RAID system and all of that. But very few people really have this sense of scale. And if astronomy is anything, it's about big numbers. So that's next week, million, billion, trillion. And I hope our viewers will all 
tell their friends about it because it's going to be one of those really, wow, mind blown, awesome, fun activities that we can all do together. Very cool. Very cool. Excellent. Well, I think that uh, I think you have motivated more people to, to uh, make their uh, uh, record their observations. I know Cameron Gillis as, is definitely on a mission to get everybody to do that as well. And uh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And so, um, well, uh, I guess uh, until next Monday, uh, Daniel, uh, we will uh, we'll see you until unless you happen to be popping in on one of our ep other episodes, of I, which I you're always to. welcome. So yes, I've I've been uh, I've been uh, involved in uh, I have a new book project going. Oh, uh, so announcing it now would be a bit premature, but uh, yes. I'm working on that. Uh, I'm also uh, I'm working on two new books actually, because I'm. I'm just a glutton for punishment. Jeez. Uh, I'm working on a couple new books. I'm building my observatory and uh, I'm hoping we're going to get concrete here in the next week or two. And when we do, I will share photos with all our, our viewers and you will get to participate vicariously in the Barthland okay. Ranch Observatory. Sounds good. And uh, if, you, uh, if you come visit the lovely Ozark Mountains, uh, of Central America, <coughs> Arkansas, <laughs> uh, yes. where the folks, uh, I have it on good authority, uh, not being from here. The people who, uh, who, are, who grew up here are Oregon Sawyers. Uh, it's only the damn Yankees Oregon who call themselves Sawyers. Arkansans. Yeah. I thought I was being bluffed by a good friend. And then I saw it in print. Yeah. Arkansas yeah. Sawyers. So, well, you know, they, they called it Arkansas. It used to be called Arkansas. It I did. Mean, that, was, that was the name of the state, you know, but they, they did didn't it. want to be known as the Arkansas, you know, somehow lesser than Kansas itself. So they had a, uh, they passed a law. They had a debate. They and the, a uh, and the, they, they did. They had a debate in the House and the Senate of the state of Arkansas, and they passed a law that well, it would be called Arkansas. This, this debate's going down and stuff, and these guys are ye yelling and screaming about calling it Kansas or Arkansas. You're not a real Arkansas. <laughs> but no, I was I was reprimanded by yeah. a good friend who did There's grow that, up here for saying that. Arkansan. He's like, oh damn. Ooh. Only damn Yankees say Arkansan. Ooh. That's that's what the people on the TV news who were never here until they moved here. That's what they say. Yeah. Don't be like that. Yeah. So, but I, I like the way Arkansas kind of rolls off the tongue, you know, so it's I do cool. Too. Yeah. Arkansas right. sounds a little, you know, but anyhow. Until next week, my friends. Yep. Keep looking up. Clear skies to you all. And we'll see you next week when we're going to do really big numbers. It's going to be a really big show. Really big. Really and big. Recognize that reference. You're older I... than me. So. <laughs> Take care, everybody. And bye bye now. Bye bye. Hello everybody, this is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific, and today I want to talk about the world famous Galileo Telescope Kit. This is a kit that you assemble by yourself. You will learn how optics work by assembling the objective lens uh, and also the eyepiece. And there's two different eyepieces that are in this, a 25 power, 20 millimeter eyepiece, but it also comes with this very clever little device here that works both as a Barlow lens that will double the magnification of this eyepiece, making it 50 power, or it can be used also as a Galilean eyepiece, which gives 17 power to the telescope. This is what Galileo virtually saw through his own telescope. So you can have that same experience that Gal Galileo had looking at the moon, uh, looking at Saturn's rings, looking at Jupiter. Uh, it is a telescope that was designed for the International Year of Astronomy in 2009. And uh, it's a fantastic kit, both for child and adult, uh, to learn how a telescope works. And so 
if you get the telescope like this, you can either have it on a stand like this, you can hand hold it like a pirate's glass, or on the bottom here, we have a, a threaded hole here that you can put it on a camera tripod. Very versatile, very rugged, and a lot of fun, all from Explore Scientific.